Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. I am once again joined by Peter Franson, creator of Spirit Blade, the epic radio trilogy that I had him on, I think, six or seven years ago for the first time, where I, I had just discovered your work. And just to briefly reiterate that, I'm a huge radio drama connoisseur, and I noticed that a lot of it just wasn't Christian, unless you do focus on the family, in which case everybody knows that. And I was looking, are there any radio dramas that are Christian? And I, that's where I found your spirit blade. And I was like, wow, this is this is really good. And then I realized you weren't even a part of an organization. I'm like, wow, this is really good, you know? And so I, I try to listen to it as often as I can, at least, you know, every year or so. And this is how I put it. It's kind of like a book. If you read a book once, especially if it's a book you haven't read before, you have trouble, you're not going to be able to absorb all of the content in the book. And so you're going to have to read it again and again. And if it's a good book, the more you read it, the more you get out of it. And that's sort of what C.S. Lewis talks about with the Chronicles of Narnia, right? Children's books, if written well, even an adult can read and get enjoyment out of it. Now, with a radio drama, you have another layer of complication, right? The one layer is it's its strength. The strength of a radio drama is that you can envision it in your head. And if it's something like Focus on the Family's Chronicles of Narnia, well, that's easy. You just jump right in because we all know C.S. Lewis. But if it's a very like new, fresh idea, even though there are elements from pop culture and or the Bible that you include that people can understand, the whole story is not one we're familiar with. So it takes multiple listens to sort of get to some of the deeper themes. And that's sort of where I want to go with this. But um, I guess just to briefly rehash sort of how what led you to create Spirit Blade? Um. Well, just well. First off, thanks again so much, Todd, for having me. It's always I always enjoy you know any I think any creative type if someone enjoys their work and wants to talk to them about it is going to be like yeah okay great you know <laughs> so thank you so much for the opportunity um, and yeah I mean it's it's just the outgrowth of all kinds of uh, nerd um, entertainment a lot of comic book influence I've been a DC Comics fan for a long long time. Um, certainly some elements of Farscape find their way, um, into some of the tonal things and other things that I'm playing around with and the fish out of water aspect of, of Merrick. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's a hodgepodge of a bunch, a bunch of different things. And it's also, you know, on the thematic level, um, an outworking of dif different things that I was exploring in my own mind and in my faith and in, you know, what my different struggles of faith looked like you know so I, I think uh inadvertently all three parts of the spirit blade trilogy are kind of an outgrowth of a different stage in my own faith life i think there's parallels between what merrick is going through and and just kind of what i was going through and processing um at the you know at the, the times before writing each part of that trilogy so uh yeah it's a lot of different stuff but those would be the things that i guess would first come to mind Right. So one of the the big ideas that I think is really interesting uh, that Spirit Blade gets into is the sort of like layers of decision making. And so, for example, okay, there's gonna be a lot of spoilers in this. So if you haven't seen Spirit Blade, watch it, for, listen to it first. Or if you don't care, then fine, you don't care. Um, one of your characters, Vincent, goes through. See, this is what this is what I really appreciate about Spirit Blade. What a good storyteller does is he has he has a character who wants he wants to fall, but he wants it to be organic. Mm -hmm. So there's certain elements of the character Vincent that, again, of course, his fall is orchestrated by the Dark One that plays upon what his weaknesses are. Right. So yeah. after uh, Isaiah dies, yeah, he's then say, "I'm the protector. I failed to protect." That's his identity that creates a crisis of co a confidence. And then throughout the, the second one, Dark Ritual, that's where the Dark One plays on that. And then, you know, has his fall. And it's it's a very believable uh, account of a guy who's struggling with his identity, being manipulated through his own lack of faith and over inflated view of himself. But there's this sort of like concentric circles. You have the individual actor, Vincent, right? Vincent thinks it's all him. And then you in the uh, the musical version, you have the song Used, where... The implied theme is, well, Vincent, you think you're acting on your own, but you're not. You're being manipulated by the Dark One, who's the stand-in for the devil. But then also, everything the Dark One does is accounted for already by the Only, who's the stand-in for God. And everybody thinks that they're making their own decisions. And as long as they think they're making their own decisions, things don't work. 
But no matter what decisions that they make, from the point of view of the only, it still all works out. And a lot of people will complain about Christianity and say, well, that's one of the problems about Christianity. How does all of this work? Our choices plus the God who's on top, sort of who's sovereign. And I think there's this really interesting level of both character development and choices, the idea of God's sovereignty, and how you can be manipulated and controlled while still thinking that you're the agent who's really the sole, sole cause of your action. Mm. Could you just get a little bit into how you came to put all those layers together, what inspirations you had, what you read, maybe in the Bible or or in other literary works or whatever? Yeah, uh, it's... I think it was, I'm trying to remember when exactly it was. Uh, let's see, I, the, the original version of the first part of the trilogy came out in 2006, and I was a worship pastor for the two years leading up to that. Um, and let's see, prior to that, so in 2004 about is when when we did the live show at my church, but, you know, a couple years before it came out as a recording. I think that leading up to that point, was when I was sorting through issues of um, free will and predestination. And um, and I, um, for about a year there, really was a probably a hardcore Calvinist, um, like to the point of like choice is an illusion, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that, that uh, ironically, I don't really get into a lot of the the God sovereignty choice predestination stuff until the third part a world of shadows. And by then I had long since come to a more moderate view that uh, really came out of processing a, um, well, several things. One was a book called uh, beyond the cosmos by Hugh Ross, which kind of suggests how God's sovereignty can um, coexist perfectly with man's truly free will uh, if we allow for um, higher dimensionality um, and the, the, the suggestions of higher dimensionality that 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 scientists are seeing as they explore quantum physics, you know, um, and uh, and a combination of that and then also just seeing in Scripture that like, well, it is, Scripture says that God is absolutely sovereign that he is ultimately control and, and permits or brings into motion everything and how you how you use those words, you know, how do you differentiate between the two? That's a big challenge. But whatever, whatever that is, whatever that looks like, the Bible also clearly teaches the responsibility that we each have for our choices. And so choice cannot be an illusion. You know, uh, it's we are held responsible for it. And God is good. And so he's not going to uh, hold a good God does not punish people for things that they are not responsible for, you know? So it was the tension of wrestling with that, that, uh, some of, uh, some of these ideas or, you know, the, the wrestlings of them, uh, came out of, um, and I think, um, but I mean, the, 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 the fact that, you know, once one choice led to another, led to another, led to another, that I would love to take a lot more credit for that than I can. It was really just as I started thinking about the story for A World of Shadows that those kinds of things started lining up. And I and I just applied um, what I believe about the nature of the coexistence of predestination and free will to the story and the different like things that had happened in the first two. And I started myself kind of seeing you know, like connecting um, cause and effect chains that I didn't I wasn't necessarily planning. I mean, I wasn't thinking about that last moment in a world of shadows where all those clips play back and forth. And before we, before we started, uh, before we started recording, I even like just jotted down, okay, what chains do I at least remember? And you mentioned some of them either before we were, uh, recording or, or, or since, but Atlantis kills Isaiah. Vincent then vows that he's not going to let that happen again, that kind of thing happen again. And you very astutely use the word identity. Um, that wasn't intended uh, as in my mind, like this is his identity, um, but it absolutely was his identity. And even as I was making my notes, I was like, that's really an identity thing. And how relevant is that to today? People. Let me deciding. just interject real quick. Yeah, There's yeah. a scene in The Dark Ritual where Rand actually says that. Oh, is there? There's a scene in Dark Ritual where Rand <laughs> says... You would know better than I would at this point. <laughs> where he says to Merrick that this was his identity. Mm. 
Hmm. I think it was Dark Ritual. Okay. Um, yeah. So, sorry, but, but, uh, so, but I mean, gosh, isn't that, th that idea of identity all the more relevant today? So that's, that's like who he is. If he's not that, then what is he? And then he, the dark one kills David. That's a choice the dark one made to kill David. Um, and then Vincent, because he's made this thing, his identity snaps at that point. And then that results in him killing quote unquote Claudius. Right. Uh, and then, but the, it was the real Claudius who had actually died, you know, long before then his pettiness, his sinful pettiness that created this contingency to release the archived copies of the, the fragments of the Bible to Victoria. Um, and then it was Victoria. I mean, she actually wasn't going to release it to the world. She was being abusive verbally, at least to her son. And so that was sin on her part. And then her son doesn't want to release the Bible to the world for the good of the world. He wants to get at, get back at his mom. And so in his own sin, he is retaliating uh, by, by publishing these, these uh, forgotten uh, manuscripts and, and copies of the Bible to the world, makes it just published to everybody in the world. And then after that, there's one more little nugget. Atlantis, through their news outlet, says, don't read this, people. Don't read this. They're trying to, in their sin, trying to conceal the truth. And then people, it's kind of suggested by Rand briefly. But you can, you can read between the lines and say that, well, people, when you're told not to do something, what do you do? So they, even the people don't read the Bible at this point, at the end of the trilogy, out of the goodness of their heart and their desire to seek truth. It's, it's out of a sort of rebellion of their own that's kind of been set up. I mean, all the pieces were inadvertently put in place, you know. And so then, they, then read it. And then the suggestion is that, that truth in some way is discovered at least to some greater degree on a worldwide level. And to at least some degree, the global tide starts to turn in favor uh, of truth. And, uh, and so like... There are some of those, I mean, the, the, the chain, the cause and effect chains that were actually part of a world of shadows, um, those were intentional with this predestination free will theme in mind. But the ones prior to that, I, I don't think they were. I don't think I was thinking about this, uh, the, the predestination free will theme when I was writing Dark Ritual. So it's just the nature of, I think, writing, you know, when, when, when people are writing stories, they are able to have such control over the stories that it can be a lot more obvious, those cause and effect chains, um, than in our own lives where all these kinds of seemingly superfluous details are still in the mix. Whereas in a, in a two hour movie, we cut out all the details that don't actually serve the story that we're trying to tell. And so we can really just see much more clearly some of these, you know, cause and effect chains. So, um, that's kind of where, you know, that, that stuff, uh, generated from, from some of it, uh, accidentally, but then more intentionally for, uh, starting with the world of shadows. Well, well, yeah. So to add to that, right. Um, so at the end of dark ritual, that's when Vincent goes rogue because he's seen the failure a second time of his ability to protect. So then he goes on his, his revenge spree, but then the way you orchestrate his return is it turns out that. The third time he fails to protect when he kills uh, Darian's wife and uh, child mm. yeah. is it's his fault. Mm. That's what yeah. finally wakes him up because he ends up contradicting his own principles. Yeah. And I thought that was very well done because if like Vincent's so far out, he's so far gone. How are you going to orchestrate in a believable way Vincent coming back? Yeah. And, and you do it by having Vincent violate his own principles. Mm. And then at that point, you have a choice. You either just keep going or you turn back. Yeah, you've got you've that that's the key crisis you have to get through. So if there if there was any way for Vincent to come back, that's how it would happen. So I thought that was a very clever way of having, you know, having Vincent's character. Sorry, the dark one thought that he had won by getting Vincent to do all this. Yeah. But in fact, from the point of view of the only it got Vincent back where he needed to be. Yeah. Right. So you have this like layer of sovereignty, because in a sense, even the dark one is sovereign but it's that lowercase s limited sign, mm. right? Yeah. He yeah. even says in War of Shadow, I'm the prince and power of the air, right? Mm -hmm. God has for now given me this kingdom. Yeah. So, right, there is this limited sovereignty that he has. Yeah. Uh, and we see Vincent's choices under the Dark One's limited sovereignty, under God's absolute sovereignty. Yeah. And and also with, with uh, uh, yeah, the, the Claudius Falcor's daughter her son the way he gets back i'm like okay how 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 could you make a teenage kid important in this story 
Because, mm. you know, when you have this whole big epic quality to it, throwing a teenager in can kind of ruin it. Because, like, well, how can a teenager affect this? Yeah. But, like, it's it's done in such a, a good way. It's so petty like a teenager, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to yeah. mom and dad. Yeah. But also, it's hugely important. Yeah. Right? It's it's like the last thing anybody expected. It, yeah. it kind of reminded me of, like, the Lord of the Rings, how Smeagol is the final piece that makes it work hmm. right even frodo says the same without Gollum, this couldn't have worked and so i mean i don't want to say he's like exactly like Gollum, but like Gollum, this little insignificant creature his own twisted selfishness is still the motive factor behind what completes the quest yeah because i you know i wanted to i wanted the trilogy all right did i lose you i'm not seeing your picture oh i'm still here okay um, I, I wanted the the trilogy to so many stories end with like the main character being the hero, the one that rises up, the one that makes it all happen. And as is said at the end of a world of shadows, I mean, Merrick says this of himself, you know, I'm not the hero of the story. It's not even my story. It's his. It's always been his story, you know, um, and we just all play different roles in it. And I, I think that what I enjoyed about um, Raynan, that's the, the teenage boy, is that, yeah, that whole thing came out of nowhere. And I think that, um, you know, this is a story where we are being, you know, uh, aided by the writer to see how something totally unexpected can be used to serve God's purposes. And the hope there is to help encourage or develop or sp a perspective in our own lives that like, you know, I might never see what God is doing in my life. I might never see how he's working, but I know that he is. And maybe I'll hear those stories in eternity. I think there's a really good chance that we will. But like, you know, all the people whose lives might have been changed in the world of spirit play by getting their hands in the Bible, they're not going to know anything about Rainin. Uh, or about what's going on with his mom. They're not going to know any of that, but, but um, their lives would be incredibly changed for the better forever. Um, and so I, I think that as we're just kind of going through life and feeling like the things we're doing are not having impact, we're not the person we thought we would be, we don't have the platform or whatever, the, the significance, the purpose, we're, we don't, we're not seeing what our lives are amounting to in this life. You know, there is uh, every reason to think that the most amazing things that God is doing through us, we're not going to know about in this life. Yeah. Uh, to go back to an earlier point you made, yes, if you're writing the script for a movie or writing a play or writing the script for a radio drama, you, the creator, of course, determine the outcome. But the difference between a good and a bad writer, it's making the determined outcome seem believable. Mm. Right, We all know a lot of ham-fisted, badly written plays, films, and radio dramas where it's like, well, of course it happened that way because of, we have a word for that, plot armor, mm. right? That's the word that we use. But I think what, what Spirit Blade does is, we, you know, you're not appealing to plot armor, right? There's this deeper uh, expression. Unless you're, unless you're looking at Merrick. Merrick has meta plot armor. <laughs> well, well, no, but hold on. Okay, you're giving, you're, you've been given a spiritual gift, right? So... Uh, to that point, I, I love it how he closes the portal to uh, Abydos by just jumping into it. He's like, well, I'm not going to die. So mm. he just jumps into the portal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very creative way of like problem solving where you know you have one constant and that constant's the fact you're not going to die. Yeah. So if that's the constant, how, how do you then use that to solve a problem? But the other thing I want to get at is I think one of the key lessons at the end of a world of shadows, where I think it's one of the last surges Merrick has, he says that he, he finally is able to lead the resistance to victory by giving up control. He says something very important. He says, I wanted just enough control to avoid being in pain. Hmm. That's, that's, that's what he says. And then yeah. that last surge, he's like, I know that I have to give that up. Hmm. And so there's an interesting thing theme here. Hmm. So in first Corinthians seven verses 29 to 31, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use the world as not misusing it, for the form of the world is passing away. So it's not so much that Paul is saying that having any of those things is wrong, but 
what it is is that you can't you can't fight to control to keep them hmm. because all of these things will eventually go away. Yeah. So you you can use them, but don't use them. Don't let that use warp your understanding to control and keep. And this is what's interesting, right? Whether it's the Dark One or Legion or Claudius Falco or his daughter or Vincent or any of these other characters, they all seek to control, to dominate, to maintain their position. And the more they try to do that, the more it slips away, right? Mm. Tolkien says in The Return of the King, as Sauron stretches out his hand to grab more power, it slips through his fingers. Mm. And so we have on the one side of the ledger, everybody who's trying to fight to hold that control. And the more they fight for it, the more they hold it, the more it leaves. Hmm. And of course, Ran, he never fought for it in the first place, which is why Ran, even though he has a hard life in the story, he has a good end. He has a, he has a good life because he's not seeking control. Yeah. And then when Merrick finally learns that lesson, everything works out. That's, that's a really profound element you've weaved into that. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's a big part of what I have struggled with for the longest time. And, and, I think was progressively gaining some insight over while I was working on that trilogy for whatever the, you know, the 10 plus year stretch, you know, from beginning to end. Um, because I uh, have always been kind of a worrier and a what if -er and a doubter. And um, I, my wife calls me paranoid boy because I'm always kind of like planning for contingencies because I feel like if I plan for contingencies, then I can have better control over my life and avoid pain, you know? <laughs> um, and what's what's tricky about that uh, is that, I mean, we even see this in Proverbs, that you do tend to avoid problems and pain if you are wise and think in advance, you know? But to pursue that out of a, out of a desire or illusion to have control over your life instead of trusting God, that is not the biblical view, you know? So, um, so yeah, I, I, th that's one of the ways, one of several ways that I think Merrick's journey was kind of paralleling my own and his realization that like, you know, he really, he wants all these answers that he's not getting starting really in dark ritual. He's like, why is, where are you God? Why are you letting this happen? And then he's living and that came after um, a really difficult time uh, a couple of years as a worship pastor, where I was just uh, really hurt by people in the church. And so I was coming off of that very wounded. And it was in that place that I wrote Dark Ritual and dealing with the wounds of people in the church, just like Merrick was tortured by people kind of, you know, the associated with worship of the only, you know, you know in a, but it got twisted and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, just realizing with all these questions in A World of Shadows, why, 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 that like he really doesn't, th those answers wouldn't really satisfy him. Those answers, when I've asked similar questions, wouldn't really satisfy me. Sometimes I can get the intellectual answer, but it still doesn't make me feel better. And that's because I needed to realize, you know, you don't really just want to know this propositional truth. What you want, Pater, is control. And no amount of answers to these questions of why, why, why are going to give you control and and give you safety and guarantee your safety. You know, so that's uh, th that just really came from uh, just a real personal place in my own uh, weaknesses and, and shortcomings in that area of my faith. But, but again, I think that was a very unique representation of that. There's these deep mm. themes that are expressed that, you know, flow out of reading the scripture, reading literature. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind a lot is these sort of layers of causes, uh, the Lord of the Rings, because like there's, there's all these layers of causes, right? There's the ones that want to keep power and control, Boromir, Denethor, Saruman, it all, you know, they all have different negative outcomes because of that. Sauron himself, right? There's those that have this idea of God and this sort of like, you know, what maybe what C.S. Lewis called the Tao, these universal moral principles. Hmm. They follow those, right? And how do they, how do you tell the good guys from the bad guys? Well, the bad guy, the good guys refuse to use the ring. They refuse to take it. Gandalf, hmm. Galadriel, right? They're offered the ring and they refuse it. Yeah. And to what not granted to you you have read the lord of the rings correct i you know what I, <laughs> i've no. seen i've seen the movies and i really enjoyed the movies 
his style of prose is just a bit too uh, archaic and formal for me. I'm more of a Terry Brooks, Terry Goodkind kind of guy. Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, because I was going to ask you. Well, maybe it comes through in the movies, but that sort of like le that level of integrated causality of different levels of agents acting mm. uh, is something you'll see in the Lord of the Rings in a, in a, in a separate context. Mm. And I wondered, but there's other books, other works you could read or expose yourself to that would show that. I yeah. just bring that up because that's what really comes to mind for me. Um, related, but another thing you brought up, which I think was interesting and I want to get to is simulated pain. So in Dark Ritual, where the Santafi are torturing Merrick, none of it's real, hmm. right? None of it's actually real. At the end, you know, Rand comes up and he's like, hey, it's not real. Salos, by this point, has reconsidered his own position. And here's what's interesting, right? The, the simulated pain of Merrick is as real in a sort of like subjective sense as real pain. So mm. what's the difference between having your hand dug into with a knife versus the simulated feeling of having your hand dug into with a knife? Well, there is a difference, but on the receiving end of it, it doesn't feel like much of a difference at the time. Mm. And so that's what modern life has sort of created for us simulated pain in the sense that we ought to, we feel like we ought to be worse off physically than we are, but we're not because the pain mm. we suffered feels real because it is, but there's no obvious source of it. I mean, in the case of the story, Salos is the obvious source of it, but in most of our lives, there's no obvious source, mm. but it also leaves no physical mark in the same way that when you got rid of the illusion, uh, there was no physical mark on Merrick. So is there anything that sort of led you either from your own experience or reading other books that you wanted to like dive into this idea of simulated pain, which is, as re which feels as real as real pain, even, if, even if you're not really going through actual trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, there, there wasn't, I, I think that, I mean, the whole idea of them using Miracli in the spirit world to create this simulation of being in the physical world and creating these things. That was just kind of a more of a nerdy uh, conceit of the fantasy concept of the spirit world and of Miracli than it was any kind of uh, theme going on there. But what was important to me was to parallel in all the physical torture that Merrick was going through. I wasn't representing. Um, at least not first in my mind, I wasn't intending to parallel the physical pain that believers can go through in the real world. Now, to be sure, I did think about and did a little bit of reading on um, some believers that were tortured for their faith, you know, or were killed for their faith. Um, and I wanted to, you know, treat that with sobriety. But my intent really was to reflect the much more common parallel of us as Christians being emotionally hurt by people in the church. So uh, that was really uh, what what I was what I was getting at there. Not necessarily uh, playing around with the idea of simulated pain, but that's really interesting. Well, because for example, uh, chronic pain, which a lot of people deal with, mm -hmm. is something that. I mean, in, in my understanding, in the past, you either got sick and got better or got sick and died. The idea of prolonged chronic pain is mm. highly unusual, but mm. it's extremely common now. Mm. And in, in one sense, it's real, but in the other sense, it doesn't seem to leave an obvious mark, right? You can't say, oh, I got stabbed right here and then point to where you got stabbed, right? It's, and it's even hard to describe to a medical professional or friends, like, what's actually wrong? Yeah. And it's, so in that sense, it's simulated. Where, and by that, I mean, if you were to change your environment in some way, it would go away, right? It's, it's some complicated, it's some complicated response to environmental factors, hmm. but the environmental factors are often so complex. Individuals can't actually tell you what that is. Hmm. And I thought that was now, again, you know, maybe that's not what you intended, but I think that let me put it this way. What I think you describe with Merrick and Salos is something that we've all gone through to greater or lesser degrees and you might not have been self-conscious of it, but it, I think it was a subconscious reality that you were describing. Does that sound? Well, it's either subconscious or, you know, one of the cool things, just speaking about God's sovereignty. And I see this in, in movie, in tons of movies that are written by non-believers that in God's sovereignty, he will just sometimes use 
storytelling in ways the creator does not intend, even subconsciously, to create parallels that will then trigger in the mind of the recipient of that content some thoughts that are really worthwhile. And so, if anything, that would be my guess, my guess that the Lord was doing something like that um, in your mind as you were kind of uh, taking in the story and processing it. Well, that would be the theme of Spirit Blade, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be the theme of the whole story, right? So yeah, yeah. That, that would actually make sense. But um, so with with this whole like sort of layered, uh, you know, persona of, of deep uh, themes as well is how you handle the, the demonic. Because what's interesting, we live in a materialistic age where the spirit and the soul are either diminished or denied outright. And so by extension, any sort of demonic realities are denied outright. Now, the idea of things going bump in the night hasn't gone away. We have whole subcultures of alien abduction, you know, uh, weird folk stories, you know, about some, you know, you go to creepy pasta or whatever, you know, all that stuff. Now, so from a Christian point of view, many people would think, well, maybe this is just how they manifest now, right? In a way that people today could could understand. And we see this with, you know, the demons. They don't manifest as demons. They manifest as aliens, right? They manifest mm. as benevolent, uh, you know, extraterrestrials who are going to help elevate humanity. Yeah. Now, you know, the the Christians, the seekers, they know that they're actually demons. And that's mm -hmm. the challenge. How do you convince everybody else that they're demons? Yeah. Well, it's interesting if you've seen, I think, was it last year? There was those UFO hearings and, and the government. Yeah. It seems like the acceptance of paranormal or outside of what narrowly scientific worldview will tell us exists. Um, pe people are having a harder time denying it. Hmm. Uh, right. Even, even the quote official representatives have to find some answer for it because they can't make it go away. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, but to, like to what extent, so to what extent, but what is interesting to me here about this is you're sort of like incorporating their activity in a world that denies their existence. Hmm. It's like, well, we deny that you're not really who you say you are, but we're, but they're still going to manifest in a way that people have to interact with them. So hmm. could you explain that process a little bit? Oh gosh. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I was certainly thinking of the phenomenon of UFOs when I first started, when I constructed the basic premise of the whole trilogy. Um, and, uh, the, um, oh gosh, what are the, even the aliens called in the, the spirit blade trilogy? It's, it's the, I don't even remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't listened to these in at least three years or more. I haven't listened to any of these. So I'm just going off of dusty memories that I'm trying to blow off for you here. But, um, but the, uh, uh, but I, I don't think I was, I, when I extrapolated and like, okay, they're not just UFOs. They're actually, and they're not just abducting people. They're actually around and like having press conferences type things. You know, I mean, they are, they're much more accessible um, to interact with on this larger scale than than they they currently are and i don't i don't think i was looking to necessarily lean into speculating about the future of our experience with ufos and where that might go could it develop to this kind of really uh intricate deception on the part of demons you know um i i think i was just playing more with the idea of how what seems to be benevolent, what seems to be putting up a, um, a, a kind and open and loving kind of front um, and, and that is accepted broadly by most people to be such uh, may not actually be. And there might actually be something that is harmful either by accident or intentionally harmful to us um, by just unthinkingly accepting at face value, you know, what, uh, what we're being told. Yeah. I remember they're, they're the Shada. Thank you. The Shada. I love the yeah. Shada. Um, now you had mentioned earlier that the Santafi were supposed to be representatives of the lived experience of having other Christians hurt you. Yeah. Now, now it's a little bit more than that. They're actually being controlled by the dark one who's masquerading as the high priestess. Well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say controlled. Okay. Um, they have been deceived, and I think that they are at fault for allowing themselves to be deceived because somewhere along the way, 
they liked something about what the dark, what the what the priestess, the high priestess was telling them, um, and uh, and so they allowed them so, and, and they and they neglected to really push the high priestess when the high priestess would say, "No, we don't read the texts. We don't read the texts. They're too holy to touch. Just listen to me," you know, and uh, and so they were willingly submitting themselves to someone that was deceiving them. And the response, yes, the, 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 there's certainly major fault. Uh, I mean, it, the, 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 the sin is the dark one. The sin is the, you know, this quote unquote high priestess, you know, but they were also allowing themselves to be deceived. And there is a degree to which they are also responsible and willingly, uh, I wouldn't, I would say the word control is not completely inappropriate, but at the very least they were allowing themselves to be controlled. Maybe manipulated is a better word. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit lighter. Um, I, I love how you invented a whole slogan of expletives. Uh, jagged, frezzed, <laughs> uh, and drac. <laughs> how did you come up with all of these non-expletive expletives? Well, I was inspired by the, um, by the, like the alien cuss words in uh, Farscape. Um, and you could kind of... I mean, some of them, they have, like, Frez, of course, that has some reminiscence to the F-bomb, you know, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. And Drac, you know, you could, sometimes the way that's used, it's like, well, is that, like, is that, uh, like, feces? Is that poop? Is that what we're saying there? Is it, like, a, just another word for crap or something? But I used them, almost all of them, I think I used just inconsistently enough so that you couldn't quite guess what they might be talking about. And um, it's kind of assumed in my mind that they are referring to something that the, that is doesn't exist in our current world, some technology, some phenomenon, some kind of thing that we just haven't run into yet. Um, glitched, we can see that in a modern context, you know? Um, so that wasn't too far-fetched, but the rest of them would be things that, terms that haven't been generated yet for things that don't exist yet. Um, but then find their way into slang and becoming expletives uh, later on. So the main idea was to kind of maybe suggest kind of what it's a replacement for, but use it inconsistently that you could never say, oh, you're just using the F-bomb. No, I'm not using the F-bomb. There's something else going on there, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's I think that's all. I lost whatever else I might have been ready to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I love about that is... Um, oh, sorry. I, I remember. I remember. Um, the uh, Having some, some aspect of like a little bit of percussiveness, um, like Drac in particular, I think is stronger maybe than Frez. Frez doesn't quite have... And maybe it needs another consonant in there or something, you know, but jag that has that has some percussiveness to it. So that was part of the the process, too, is just on an aesthetic level. You want the words to have a, just a little bit of punch to them, a little bit of percussiveness. Sorry, you were going to say. No, what I like about what you said was these are technologies and new situations that have not yet developed. So what's interesting is in C.S. Lewis scholarship, and it's often applied to Tolkien as well, is this concept called bonagality, which is where you create a sense of a lived deep reality, but you only show a little bit of it. Yeah. Okay. That's what I think that you're getting at, but it's a kind of like, rather than a past sense, it's a future sense. Yeah. It's, it's a sliver of a sense of a future reality that doesn't yet, and maybe won't ever exist. But, yeah. and while we're, while we're on the, the, on the terminology though, whenever I would hear Frez, I almost feel like, like something shorting out. Like, yeah, that like could it's be. being fried or, mm, yeah. And then with Drac, I get the, it's, the, it's a, uh, it's something of loose consistency. Maybe like like oil or snot or huh, it's, okay. it's something of loose consistency. Yeah, because I think even when Falcor decomposes into the Nephilim in the first episode, I think the Doctor even says Drac. Hmm. I, no, no, no. It wasn't the Doctor. It was Rand. He says flush the Drac out of there. And so Drac in that mind, in my mind, Im implies something of loose consistency. Oh, interesting. Okay. Something that's you know goopy, not yeah, not anything that's solid. But yeah, jagged is solid. It's like you're getting punched or you know cut because it's yeah. a solid thing yeah and drac you know i 
that I might have heard somewhere else. Um, so it's either I either accidentally stole it at some point or it's like a weird minds think alike type deal. Um, I might have heard that somewhere else. But like, but like, yeah, jagged. I, I think that was an idea of something being it's almost sounds like jagged. Um, but like you said, like ripped or torn or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of messed up in some way. Right. I thought that was again, a very clever way of bringing that into a Christian themed content without necessarily, you know, tripping over the wires. You know? Yeah, so, I didn't want to, you know, I recognized I'm making this primarily for Christians and I don't really make any bones about that. I'm not trying to trick any non-Christians into watching it. If you go to the website, it's going to be really clear. Hey, this is, a, we're making Christian stuff and we got Christians in mind for it. So I, I knew that that was my target audience. And so um, I, I knew that, uh, it would alienate a number of them that I wouldn't want to alienate, you know, if I were to use real rough language, but at the same time, it's important, I think, to recognize that Christians and non-Christians alike come from all kinds of different backgrounds. And in some of those, you know, we just use some, some rough language. And so I wanted to, I wanted it to be okay that these characters had some rough edges to them. Well, like, for example, right, Merrick and Vince are a bit rough. They use a lot of that rough language. Mm -hmm. Rand isn't so rough. rough. Rand doesn't really use that language. Not as much, yeah. Not as much. And so you see you see a difference between those those characters. Yeah. And um, now to, to your point, though, while it was written for Christians, and then you make that no bones about that, what's nice about Spirit Blade is it has appeal to non-Christians because that's how I found it. Oh. I was I was really big into the revival of radio drama that happened like 20 years ago. I found out about it maybe around 2015. And I'm like, okay, we'll just, you know, go through the updates for the latest radio drama. I forget where I was searching, but it was some like, you know, a, a website that accumulated all the recent programs that were being put together by oh. creators. Okay. And you were listed on that. And I'm like, oh, cool. well, hey, this guy's a Christian though. He's not, a, you know, so they still thought that it had value on its own merits. Okay. So Great. I, that was really cool because that's, I wouldn't have probably found you. I didn't come at it from like the Christian side. I'm looking for Christian content by a yeah. Christian creator. I'm going to all the Christian websites and then I find you. That's not how it happened. Right. I yeah. was in a more secular setting. Yeah. So, but they noted that, yeah, this is a Christian work, but it's really good. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Cool. How does that how does that make you feel that there's like at least on its own merits right it stands up oh from uh, a non-believer's perspective yeah I'm certainly happy to hear that and I've heard from listeners I mean I mean one listener told me a story about you know what listening to the first one or the, the first two on the way to like a gaming convention that they were going to that weekend and he was um you know there was at least one or two non-christians in the car and they were all uh, according to him, really pulled in and talking about the story, talking about, you know, the characters and debating, you know, different things that were going on in the story and what they thought it meant or whatever. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, I, it's, and I think ideally that's what I would like to see happen is for Christians to find it. And then to, to know, because, because they know personally um, who they might recommend it to, you know, I think, it, I think the Christian needs to look at this and say, Hmm, you know, this friend over here, he would feel preached at, he wouldn't like this, but this friend over here, I think he would be open to it. And I want to leave that decision in the hands of the Christian, even though I do think it has a, a, a lot of potential, as you say, to uh, connect with non-Christians. I didn't want anyone ever to feel tricked into hearing about Jesus, you know. So uh, this is not related to the big themes, but maybe I just missed the... Uh, the the not being tied, but I, I in the last listen I I thought I noticed possibly not not big but two small narrative inconsistencies. The first one is uh one one of the the demons of Legion is captured in the base of the Liberation, and then that's why he says to Satan we can't fully reassemble. Now then when when um Legion is then defeated at the end of a, a World of Shadows. What what happened to that one guy at the base? Is he still at the base, or did he get sent to the binding as well? Oh yeah, you know that. I didn't bother answering that question. Um, it could have been a catch and release type scenario. The main reason that I mean, the the main thing that was being done was he was being tortured by Salos, you know. And I wanted to really 
leave the end of that scene up to the listener's imagination more so that they could imprint on it what had happened to Merrick and Dark Ritual onto what Salos was doing to this demon, you know, because he says like right before they they walk, like Salos is like, I would prefer to be alone for this, you know? <laughs> and so they leave the room, they leave him in there with this demon and he says something to him like um, that he ends whatever he says to him by saying, my little mouse, you know, which is like what he called Merrick before this horrific sequence of torture scenes began in Dark Ritual. And so, so it's like fade away and we never find out what happens because I really wanted to leave that to the viewer's imagination. So you can just plug in there whatever you want. But that said, that said, um, I would totally believe that there are other inconsistencies that you or others would find in different parts of the trilogy. I'm I'm so glad that you appreciate the story because I have uh, um, I don't think that writing is uh, I, I don't I don't think that's my strength. I think I'm a stronger, much stronger sto storyteller than a story writer. Um, and when I have gotten you know some uh, some criticism of different elements of the Spirit Blade trilogy it really does tend to lean towards some element of the writing rather than the the storytelling itself. So uh, I would not be at all surprised. Yeah, I mean, like it was in the, um, <laughs> at the there was a there was a uh, an inconsistency in the first one alone where Ran, um, I messed up in saying like he lost, I don't know, his left arm or something. And then a little bit later, he says some, there's something mentioned about his right arm being the one that was lost. And that was just, I didn't notice that until it was out in the wild. You know, I was like, oh, crap. So that was actually what helped me generate this idea that actually it was both arms. And it was a lot more of his body that got replaced than you might think, you know, just from this. And so that's why that gets fleshed out, actually, in Dark Ritual, uh, where we where, the, where he's being taunted by the demon, you know, talking about, like, you know, how much of you, I mean, are you really still even a man? So much of you has been lost. You lost this arm, and then what remained of the other was kind of like mind for tissue to spread around the other parts of the body. And so um, so he's the, the idea at the end was that he became a lot more metallic in the in concept than he was originally necessarily intended to be that's so. a clever save that's a clever save um <laughs> but here's the other one right because because i, I want to hear this from the creator okay sure okay so, so claudius falcor has like this kill switch program where he plays back everything to his daughter as his heir once he's killed um oh this is gonna be a tough one i, I no, hold I, on, hold on. there's there's a couple of triggers the first trigger is when the demons actually kill him and take over his body the second trigger is when the Nephilim, his whole body's gooped in the tank. Uh, and I'm like, wait, wouldn't that have triggered the actual program for Victoria <laughs> when he's gooped in the tank? Oh, um, if I remember correctly, the sensors that were tracking his like life patterns and stuff, they were in his office. Um, and so like they were tracking. So as long as, so I mean, like it, I think, conceptually, as long as he checks into that office at a certain time, then there's not going to be any question over whether or not he's still alive. Oh, okay. But, but if he dies in the office while the sensors are tracking him all the time, um, then that would be like, that would be a trigger. But like he died at the, 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 the other side of the planet, like on this underground lab or whatever the crap that was. Okay. Well, how about the mental takeover? They, they, they kill his mind and take over his body. Wouldn't that have triggered it? Um, no, in my mind, the, okay. the sensors were just keeping track of his, his physicality. Ah, okay. Okay. That, I mean, that's, that's what I was, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just physical science, um, tracking his, his life breedings, his life patterns his stuff at that point. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Well, cause again, maybe, maybe I misunderstood the context, but I thought, wait a minute, there might've been a couple triggers that should have triggered his death. Yeah. I remember, uh, man. Oh man. I just, <laughs> just, just thinking through that whole thing, like exactly what's like, okay, so this triggered now, should this have triggered before? And like, um, I was, I was pretty darn confident by the time I, I kind of finalized all that, that I had thought through it all. But at the same time, I was like, you know, that could, if, if I missed something that could easily be a spot where I missed something. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know for sure. No, no. But like, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm only, you know, playfully picking at it. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a huge nitpicker normally, and there's not much in my mind to nitpick about the story. But these are just a few things that I noticed that I was like, well, wait a minute, does does Peter have an answer for this? Yeah, well, but, um, I take I take that as a compliment, honestly, because 
I think that as as hardcore nerds and fans of what we love, we tend to really um, nitpick the things that we really enjoy the most because we spend more time with them and we kind of like want it to work out in our minds. I had a friend in college that uh, used to propose that the, um, the the matte squares that would appear around the TIE fighters in Star Wars that you could see before they cleaned it all up with the special editions were the deflector shields. I mean, she knew something was up. Like the, the, that was like a little flaw in the visual effects that was that was poking through. But she and her friend just resolved, no, we decided that was the deflector shields, you know? And so, but you do, yeah, you do nitpick. You do, do notice things with the stuff that you really enjoy and spend a lot of time with. So I take that as that I'm honored that, uh, that you would find those things. <laughs> All right, so this is the last question before I wrap up. Okay. So when C.S. Lewis wrote Screw Tape Letters, he said, People think it might be fun being playing the demon side, but it's not. He said mm. it was really soul draining and taxing to write from the point of view of demons mm. on how to hurt people. Now you play the dark one. <laughs> so how, how do you agree with Lewis? Uh, did, was it different for you? Like in, in what sense was it like for the, for the sake of constructive criticism for Christians? I mean, it's what Lewis, Lewis did with screw tape letters. He nonetheless, he still thought that was very difficult and wouldn't have wanted to do it again. Uh, so, what, what was your experience doing that? Well, um, I don't remember having it was it was harder for me to process Merrick's torture and to play those scenes and to really and to in a world of shadows have Merrick deal with the death of Ran. I had never cried while acting before that scene when, when Merrick is saying goodbye to Ran. That was the first time I, I wasn't able for years to, to summon tears, real tears while acting, but that was the first time that, that I did. And so it was some of those things that Merrick had to go through that were um, darker for me emotionally. I, I think with, um, especially since I, I'm a worrier. And so to put myself in the place of someone who is having horrible things happen to them, that's going to tend to poke at my weak areas than playing the villain. I And add to that, that the dark one, even though he's got that scene in Dark Ritual, where right before he kills David, he says that, you know, in your fictions, people like to think of me as a harmless boogeyman, you know, but sometimes the bad guys win. I'm I'm actually a lot more nasty, a lot more dangerous, and I'm going to demonstrate that right now, you know. Um, but even given that, I still, in the way I portray him and the way I talk, um, he, it is inspired by a sort of, um, well, it's, it's inspired by some ways with Mark Hamill's The Joker, you know. He has this sort of theatricality about him, you know. And so he's just, it's because we know that that Lucifer is very prideful. And so I imagine him as, very like um decadent or really wants to be decadent he's a man of wealth and taste what's that he's a man of wealth and taste yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah he's, he's and so um I, I think playing that kind of role actually in some cases um was was kind of fun just because it had this kind of elevated theatricality to it um as he's kind of just obsessively pointing to himself, you know? Um, and so that's kind of fun to, to play around with. Uh, but yeah, ironically, no, it's, it wasn't the, the, the hardest or the darkest place, you know, for me personally to go to. All right. Well, now that we are at the end, uh, one, where, where can people find you? Uh, and, and two, everybody should definitely watch or rather listen to Spirit Blade. It's great. Peter Francis put a lot of work into it. So, uh, yeah. And then what are your projects? So uh, right. Yeah, well, a, a couple year and a half ago, about I released um, my own version of From Beyond by H.P. Lovecraft, producing it as a one man audio drama, since it's kind of written in a way that can lend itself to that. And that was an exp was a uh, I used that and created some supporting materials to go with it to explore the idea of fear and worry, fear of the unknown. So that was a very personal project in some ways, even though I didn't I didn't write it. Um, and that's available for a dollar on our Patreon page in multiple versions. I really went nuts with all kinds of different versions, iterations of that uh, project, but that's patreon.com slash spirit blade productions. Um, and if you jump on the $10 tier for a month over there, you can just spend that month downloading my entire audio drama production library, including all of 
uh, the Spirit Blade trilogy in both the Legacy and Special Editions, all the background material, all the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, there is a boatload if you just jump on for one month at the $10 tier at patreon.com slash Productions. That's where I would point people for my audio drama stuff. Um, and at lower tiers, you know, you could jump on for a month and still get access to a lot of audio drama stuff. But then week to week, I'm uh, doing stuff for, uh, as my shirt indicates, Christian Geek Central. ChristianGeekCentral.com is kind of a portal, portal to all the stuff I'm doing week in, week out uh, to connect with uh, Christian geeks and explore what it means to live intentional lives for Jesus in that context. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Peter. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. This was great. All right, this is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast signing off.